Hi there, my name is John Eklund. I'm a lawyer in Cleveland, Ohio. For almost 10 years, I served as an Ohio State Senator uh, representing the 18th Senate District. Pass whatever laws you want, but we should be more seriously engaged in an exercise that I call critical self-evaluation. If a law is passed intending to have certain consequences, we need to examine what the effect on those consequences is. Enhanced penalties, further criminalization for behaviors among uh, those who are infected with the HIV or who have AIDS uh, actually can serve as a deterrent to these folks seeking treatment or actually, never mind treatment, seeking a diagnosis. Now, that's a very, very bad situation. Human knowledge, human understanding of circumstances expands over the course of time. When, when these laws about enhancing penalties for uh, crimes committed by uh, people with HIV or AIDS were enacted, we knew considerably less about the disease and the condition than we know now. The analogies are not <laughs> unlike uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19 in 2020 and 2021. When this thing started spreading, nobody knew where. Everybody thought it was, you know, there were projections about how deadly it was going to be. There were projections about how easily it was transmitted and what it, what could we do to prevent it. When, when those circumstances change and the, the scope and the range of human knowledge change, I think it's contingent upon us as a society to change our laws to reflect most current knowledge and understanding of what impelled the passage of the bill in the first place. But we should be very, very careful about singling out for special treatment, good special treatment or bad special treatment, uh, elements of our citizenry who are different for some reason. And I think it's obliging upon us as citizens, and it certainly was for me as a state senator, uh, to see to it that we do justice uh, for as many people as we can and in as an, an enlightened way as we possibly can. I think it makes us all better. I think it makes our society better and it's a critical function of government. I'm trying to imagine a time when keeping a secret or hiding information helps public health. And, and right now I can't think of anything. Uh, public health relies in large part on public being informed. My name is Rick Hodges. I'm former director of the Ohio Department of Health. I also served in the Ohio House of Representatives. I feel like I've seen the evolution of, of the law as it regards to HIV notification from almost the earliest days. I think the current laws exist because back when they were first enacted, it was a very different world. Uh, AIDS was considered to be a new deadly and pandemic disease 30, 40 years ago. But today, things have dramatically changed since those laws were first passed. It is like a chronic disease where people can live full and happy lives. There's really no reason right now to, to treat AIDS any different than you would treat um, hepatitis or, or tuberculosis or any other infectious disease. By treating the diseases the same way, we're treating the people the same way. This is a human issue that, if, that affects us all regardless of the side of the, which side of the aisle we're on. It's, it's unfair to to burden a certain population where we don't burden another population. And finally, I think it really, in a way, discourages people from coming to terms with their diagnosis for seeking treatment and for seeking help when the, the threat of uh, a felony conviction is looming over them. I don't think it's, it's good for anybody. I, you know, I always say, secrets do not help me. And I, I think we need to encourage people to be open, seek treatment, and to, to live full and happy lives with their friends and families. Well, a Burgerfell versus Hodges, uh, I always like to call it a Burgerfell and Hodges versus that other guy. I felt fairly confident that I would lose, and uh, humanity and dignity won out. 
I wanted to make sure that people didn't have to wait a moment longer to enjoy the right to be married. We're all created equal. We're equal in the eyes of God and in the eyes of law. And we all need to be treated with dignity so that uh, no matter who you are or who you love or how you feel or, or what your DNA is, uh, you're special, you're important, and the laws need to reflect that. Your silence doesn't help you, and my silence won't help me, so it's better to speak. Hello, my name is Brian C. Jones. Uh, I'm a person who's been thriving with AIDS, going into my 38th year. Can you believe that? Ohio currently is considered a hot zone for prosecuting people living with HIV and AIDS. We do know that black people and people of color cover, carry the brunt of new diagnosis and, and those living with HIV and AIDS. But when it comes to looking at how the money is actually divvied up and where it's been sent to, it doesn't equal up. And HIV criminalization laws is just another notch in their belt of how they're going to imprison us. I didn't know about these laws. So I knew there were a lot of other people who were hiding in the shadows like me. I call what I was doing, I call it my Anne Frank syndrome. I was hiding somewhere waiting for somebody to open the door and discover me. You hide in silence for so long that when you step out in the open, you don't know if the past is coming, gonna creep up on you. You just don't know. And even today, I'm as open as a book about anybody can be about the status, but I still sleep on eggshells. I still wait to hear that knock on the door. And one person I met, and I, we were talking, I disclosed my status, they said, well, I'm glad you told me because I think I might have been exposed to HIV, X, Y, Z. I said, well, if you ever need help, I'll go with you to get tested. So about four months later, the person called me and said, hi, um, I need your help. I said, great. I need somewhere to stay. I said, well, that wasn't the kind of help I was talking about. I told you I would go with you to get tested. I remember the conversation you said you thought you had been exposed to HIV. They said, no. I remember that we had sex and you gave me HIV and I'm going to the police. I said, well, go ahead. Because we would have had to done at least hold hands. So you go right ahead uh, and, and think you're going to do that. But just the fact that they thought that they could do that. It made you realize that a lot of people are being incarcerated just, just on a lie. But people living with HIV currently under the law that we have now, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent and you have no defense. The fact that we as people living with HIV and AIDS just want to touch, just want to hug, just want to hold and feel human. And the, these laws take away that right from us. I'm not HIV positive. I'm a person living with HIV because I'm more than just my status. I don't have a disease. I have a virus. I didn't get infected. I contracted HIV. We're making sure that we can't transmit HIV to other people, but we're still being prosecuted. We're still being persecuted. We're still being ostracized in a major way. I'm gonna speak and I'm gonna to continue to speak for people living with HIV because this is our fight and I'm tired of asking permission to do the work that I need to do. Here she comes. <laughs> this is Gizmo. <laughs> Hi, my name is Oga Irwin. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, and I am the found one of the founding members of Ohio's decriminalization laws. Because in Ohio, it's uh, if you do not disclose your status and a person feels that they are at risk, they could prosecute you if you're able to get a, de a detectable viral load. You cannot transmit the virus. No how, no way. So there really is no need for this law right now to de uh, put us at risk for being uh, prosecuted and put in jail. One act was actually out of devious and jealousy. She liked a guy that, uh, my, one of my neighbor guys that I grew up with in my neighborhood and he was in a band and she liked him and he wasn't giving her no time of day. And, and I, I talk very openly and at the bars I hand out condoms and where to go get tested at. And I'm very open about my status no matter what, you know, when somebody asks. 
why are you doing this? And I tell them, well, she seen an article in a piece of paper about me doing a lecture for Faith Day, HIV Faith Day. And about two weeks after that, I get a letter from the prosecutor's office to come down and talk. When I get there, is this lady saying I, I put her at risk for uh, contact getting HIV by hugging her when she's sweating. Now, the second lady that uh, accused me of putting her at risk for HIV was a masseuse. I want a free, you know, full hour masseuse. Filled out the paperwork when I went there, you know, you know, any of your medical conditions, what medicines you're taking. I'm so, and I put HIV. She called me like about an hour after I got home at crying that I put her and her unborn baby at risk for HIV. I was not mad. I was upset, but I was not mad upset because I knew this was uneducated. And she found out about the laws and she tried to, I got called down to the prosecutor's office again. This was not me even having sexual contact with the person. This was just me touching them with them touching me. Plus, where I live at, I live on the border of Pennsylvania, and I live on the border of Virginia. Both of them have completely different HIV criminalization laws. Even if I go to PA and I carry my condoms with me to distribute for, you know, safe sex, you know, for a vet or something, that right there, I could get arrested for having too many condoms on me, because that is considered trick of the trade for sex work. So I could actually get... With the condoms, I could get arrested for uh, sex work and a person living with HIV get a higher sentence as a felony there instead of a misdemeanor. Looking behind our backs and all that, looking, did I disclose my status? Should I disclose my status? Is this person going to prosecute me for just touching them on the arm? So that's why we, I fight like hell. Excuse my language. I fight like hell to change the laws. My name is Francesca Schumann. I live in Columbus, Ohio. I am a trans woman. So now it's 21 years I've been living with HIV. Why are we criminalizing HIV with archaic laws on the books from the 1980s that have been been di- disproven by science. When a person has an un- undetectable status, which means your viral load cannot be detected, like that you are untransmittable. That means you are at 99.99999% of not transmitting the virus to someone else. If you are known to be HIV positive, you can be arrested just for loitering, waiting on a friend, can be considered loitering. If I'm walking with you and we're just having a conversation, if someone knows I'm HIV positive, they can say I'm soliciting you for sex and go and go to jail, which is loitering and solicitation. We as HIV positive people have to be in charge of proving we told our our status, whether that's via a text message, an index card that is signed that we keep forever in a file. I have text messages going back from 1999 and keep it somewhere safe, whether that's with the case manager and your file at the agency, whatever. Find a safe space because it becomes on you. Unless it was a meeting I was attending, I wasn't going. Unless I knew there were people around there who knew my status and were for me. I, I was not going. I would have to have pe- people go to the grocery store with me because I was in so much fear. And we need to educate people. We need more education. We need to eliminate the fear so so that people can find themselves sex worthy once again. People are sex worthy. We are created to have sex, enjoy sex, be loved, be in love be valued, be seen, be heard, be held, be touched. Of course, we have a right to pursue happiness. So I encourage you to go chase your happiness. Get your happiness. Let's talk about what you learned. How did this help you? What 
what changed to motivate you to, to join our fight to, to decriminalize HIV? Hi, I'm Kim Welter, and I am the facilitator of the Ohio Health Modernization Movement. I've spent the last three years listening to uh, people living with HIV talk about how they're impacted by Ohio's criminal codes. Our research shows that the majority of the cases in Ohio are actually harassment with a bodily fluid on a law enforcement officer. Did I just speak too wetly? <laughs> And now you're accusing me of um, spitting on a police officer. Folks are being impacted by um, arbitrary application of these laws. So right now in Ohio, no transmission is required for people to be charged under our statutes. So we do believe that there should be actual harm and that there should be some sort of proof of intent. Did the person try to do something to prevent transmission? Are they undetectable? Were they using a condom? Were they engaging in activity that doesn't have a scientific chance of passing the virus on to somebody else? All of those things should be allowed to be taken into consideration in a courtroom, and currently they are not. There also needs to be clarification about what it means to disclose. How do you prove you disclosed? If you told somebody, how do you prove that? Would modernizing the criminal code in Ohio solve all those problems? No, but it will go a long way to helping people who are living with HIV get in care, stay in care, reduce stigma, and allow them to enjoy life. For those of you who are incarcerated in Ohio under these laws, we haven't forgotten you. We're out here trying to figure out, can we help you? Can we help somebody else from avoiding what has happened to you? But that we have not forgotten you. You are remembered, you are cared for, you are loved. Stay strong.